how, is, how in the world is this next generation going to come up to speed and run the world? How are my kids going to earn a wage? How, is, how are we going to make it? How, and we look around, and it's like, ay, ay, ay. Ted Terrichuk told me a story just before the service about when he was in third grade, he was sitting in class. And the third grade teacher stood up in the front of class and said, now we are going to learn about predicates. Well, we're all going to learn about predicates except for Ted Terrichuk and his friend. They don't need to learn about predic pre predicates because by age 21, they're going to be hung by the neck until dead. That's what she said. <laughs> I mean, she didn't have any hope for Ted. Ted was a wise guy at third grade. He was uncontrollable. My daughter's a fourth grade teacher. She's got stories whenever we talk. And we look at the kids and we're like, how are they going to run the world someday? <laughs> and the way it's going to happen is because of Jesus. <laughs> and I want to talk to you about Jesus today and the hope and the help and the life and the power that, that Jesus brings into our lives. Uh, the objective I want for us in 2019 is simply to be successful, and we do that through Jesus. And so at the end of the service, I'm going to have you come forward, and I just want to pray for you that this will be a successful, wonderful year for you this year of 2019. And don't stop listening to me, because I believe this could be a very good year, not because of you, but because of him. And a lot of times we underestimate the goodness of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the ability of Jesus in our lives and his value to us. And we kind of forget he helps us sometimes or a lot more than we think. And so I want us to get to know Jesus a little bit more in this next few minutes when I talk to you. And when you get to know someone, there's various ways of doing it. When you're going to start dating someone nowadays, it may sound creepy, but I think it's the standard that you go online and you look at their Facebook, you Google them, and it's not kind of thought creepy anymore. It's like you want to find out who this person is. And so you start looking at their life online. But finally, when you get the chance to sit down with them for dinner, maybe a little bit of romantic dinner or maybe for just getting to know them, you don't start by saying, First of all, I want to establish the fact that you exist. That will turn the date south real quick. You're not thinking about debating issues of their existence. What you want to know is what do they do? How do they treat people? And so today, I don't really want to talk to you about the, whether Jesus exists or God and all that. I want to take a look at Jesus what he does, how does he treat people, and get to know him in that way. He's much the same today as he was 2,000 years ago. It was a little different audience. Uh, he, he gave the parables, but I think we could understand them the same as they did 2,000 years ago, at least roughly. We don't grow wheat today. But he said, but if God so raised the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O oh men of little faith? If I walk out in the fields and I smell the grass, I see the field. When I was a boy, I lit the field on fire. And I know what he's talking about here, that uh, it's thrown into the furnace. I've seen it burn. I smell the grass. I relate to these words of Jesus that he's going to clothe me. He's going to take care of me. Even though he spoke them 2,000 years ago, it's still really clear to me. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. I remember my mom making bread, and the dough would rise on the floor. The floor was warm, and I remember watching. It was little, and I'd go over, and it'd start to grow, and I'd poke it. And it was the leaven, it was the yeast, making it bigger. And I understand Jesus talking about when the kingdom of God's in me, I'm going to grow. The kingdom's going to grow in me, and I'm going to grow in the kingdom. It makes sense. I understand these things. I understand what it's like when the Father 
Jesus turns to the father and says, you're not going to give your hungry boy a stone instead of a bread, are you? I could feel as a boy hungry. I remember. I don't want a stone. I want bread. I could remember falling down and a knee, you know, my jeans ripped and my mom showing a, sewing a patch on that, half falling off sometimes. It, it all makes sense what he's talking about. I remember watching the little sparrows in the hemlocks. So now when Jesus talks about our value, I understand that. Those little sparrows. My grandpa had chicks in the springtime. And I'd go over his house and I would go next to those chicks and they would all run under the hen's wings. And that's where I would run, under the wings of Jesus, under the wings of God for protection. I'm not a farmer, but I've seen enough to say, wow, Jesus. Anybody who honestly reads the Gospels has got to love Jesus. They may not be converted to Christianity, but they got to say, wow, this guy is awesome. If you just honestly read the, the, the four Gospels, you've got to agree. Jesus is wonderful. So I want to refresh our look, our thoughts on how wonderful Jesus is. First of all, Jesus shows us how wonderful God is. The first time in history that we got a really accurate picture of who God is. We really couldn't know God like that until Jesus came and taught us. A lot of times I can't sleep at night, and I come in 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. My kids have been vacationing here with me, and so sometimes I'd be coming into church at that hour, and they're still up. And I'm like, well, <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm going to work, and they're still playing a game or whatever. And so I come in, I pull in my truck, and I get out, and I see the stars, and I walk around the back, and I pray, and I praise God. I mean, they're just magnificent. And because of those stars, I could see that God is beautiful. God's an architect. God's a designer. God is awesome. He's massive. But I really can't know that God loves me from those stars like I know God loves me from Jesus. There's philosophers, and there's all the sciences, you know, the philosophy and the geography and the uh, geology and astronomy. There's all the sciences. And we argue, we discuss maybe what this God might look like and all that. But no matter, we'll wear ourselves out mentally. But Jesus comes along and there it is. We know who God is. God loves us. We know from Jesus he forgives what we would think would be unforgivable. As a matter of fact, somebody wounds us and we're not ready to forgive. But God says, no, forgive them. He has mercy on those that certainly don't deserve it. He's a companion to those that are undesirable. People that you and I might not want to be companions with. He's a companion to them. He's a companion to us when others don't want to be a companion to us. He seeks to find us and lift the lost and the fallen, to pick us up, to heal the sick and set the captive free. So, so he went into his hometown, Nazareth, in the synagogue, opened the book, and that's what he read. I came to do all to set the captive free. And we know God because of Jesus. And when we see ourselves loving people and we see ourselves forgiving and being kind, we know he's, God, is behind our kindness. We're like, wow, I'm being godly right now. This is awesome. We know God, and we, we, we know God's image is in us because of Jesus. All through history, God won, God, mankind wondered about God. It was kind of like digging in the ground for, for ore, for iron ore. You're trying to find some metal in the ground. Mankind kind of did, oh, I found a piece of ore. Let's put it over here. We go to the Museum of Natural History in, in Washington, and you see these ores. You're like, I wonder what that thing is. I wonder what that thing is. But Jesus came. And he mined it. He mined the gold and the silver and the different ores. He didn't only mine it, but he, but he, he melted it down and made it into the, into the metals. And he didn't only do that, but he minted it into coins. And he stamped God's image on it so we could see it clearly. And he put it in our pocket so we could use the truths of God for currency in our lives, for life. Not just a piece of dead ore sitting over there. Somebody thought of a good truth, two and two plus four. 
oh, Jesus minds it and put it in our lives. And so we use it and we tell us and we trade. We just, it's the truths of God that become so precious to us, so beautiful to us. Jesus put God, if there was a picture frame that said and pointed in, this is God, Jesus put God in that picture frame for us. And we didn't know before it was just fuzzy, it was vague. Now it's in focus. He's known. And I guess in that picture would be the cross. And we see God, how much he loves us. He went to the cross. And so we know through Jesus, God loves us. Who else would do that for us? And the world really hasn't been the same since Jesus. Now, myself, I don't guess who God is. I don't grope in the darkness to see who God is. I don't gamble wondering if my gamble is right on who God is. I know God, and he knows me, and that's because of Jesus. Even the Apostle Paul, before he hit the Damascus Road and hit the ground, he didn't really know God. He was a Jewish zealot. But he didn't really know Jesus. He didn't know God until he met Jesus on that Damascus road. And then he knew God so that in his writings he would say, quote, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus. I know God because I know Jesus, because I see Jesus. See, we learn in Jesus God loves all of us, everybody. Because of Jesus, we know God loves morals, he loves us to be moral and ethical and do what is right and do what is good. When I was a kid, we had a dog named Coco. It was a Weimaraner. You know, Weimaraners are beautiful. This was a Coco Weimaraner. I mean, a special dog. And I was a rambunctious little kid, much like Ted, I guess. And I, and I, you know, I pushed the dog off the edge into the pond one time. And the dog went running to my father, all soaking wet. And my father called our kids, all the kids together, my two brothers and two sisters, and he said, okay, who pushed the dog in the pond? <laughs> I wasn't telling. Forget Ethics? I'm not going to be ethical. I'm not getting in trouble here. So I let my brothers and sisters go through the torture chamber because I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't a Christian that day. I wasn't reflecting Christianity. I wasn't moral. I wasn't ethical. I was a little liar. And, and rambunctious, much like Ted, probably. <laughs> but we see Jesus. He's in the wilderness. And he could have turned back and took the glories for himself, but he said, no, devil, I'm here for them. We see him in Gethsemane. And he was tempted to be immoral, tempted to turn back on the will of God and just say, I'm not going to do the cross. But he said yes to the cross. And we see him hanging on the cross. He certainly was tempted in all ways and had the urge to turn back. The temptations were there to give in to that more comfortable situation. But he followed despite the pain. <laughs> I am absolutely impressed with God, the God I see in Jesus. That's my God. And God's going to keep loving you all the way through 2019. That God is going to keep loving you every day and every moment through 2019. The God that Jesus showed on Calvary. Secondly, Jesus shows us how valuable we are. We never really catch our immeasurable value in this world until we see Jesus. Until we see how Jesus values us, what he did to get us to heaven with him. We watch Jesus in the Gospels and we realize no one really believed in mankind like Jesus did. We meet Jesus for ourselves, myself included, and we realize nobody ever really believed in me like Jesus does. And nobody ever believes in you like Jesus does and will through this year. After all we did to him, I can't speak for you. I can speak for myself. I wasn't very nice to God prior. But he still loved me. They put him on a cross and he said, forgive him, God. He loves us. And he treats us so like immeasurably valuable. When I was in the southern Philippines preaching a message 
a captain of the NPA, the New People's Army. This guy was huge and notoriously bad. Came to the altar, knelt and wept like a baby. This huge guy, a killer. And he repented. And God took him in, received him, accepted him. Because he was valuable to God beyond what he did. Jesus challenges us to accept our spiritual birthright. That you, in fact, are a child of God. You are a son of God and a daughter of God. And that's huge. We don't just invite people into our families. Taylor is going to be a part, uh, for the pretty sure, <laughs> That's the high endorsement you can give to a person to make them part of your family. When Luke last week proposed to her, he was saying, I endorse you so highly, I'm in committing to you and I'm asking you to commit and become a part of my family. You can't give a higher endorsement than that. That's a great thing. Chanel was, has been married now with Roger. How long have you been married? A little while. And Roger was recounting, as they were all up for vacation, how I called him aside before they got too involved, and I grilled him. I grilled him for three hours. He reminded me and that he got an incredible headache right in the middle of it. It was pounding, and I wouldn't let up. But I, he was going to become part of my family. This was important because I was going to endorse him, and there's no higher endorsement than to say, I want you to become part of my family. Now, Roger worked out really well, and, and I'm really glad. He's an awesome son-in-law. But you don't get any higher endorsement than inviting someone into your family and say, welcome into the family. I just talked to a friend of mine. He's an old, old school Italian. His daughter was dating a guy for a few years. And he came to this, this father and said, I'd like to marry your daughter. He said, no way. Absolutely not. He says, what? He was shocked. He said, you're lazy. You want to marry my daughter? He gave him a list. It was about a year or two ago. He's got most of the list done. <laughs> I'm serious. That was a true discussion I had just a couple weeks ago. You see, when someone's coming into your family, it's a big thing. It's important. They're gonna be, you're going to live with that person the rest of your life. And God says to you, I want you to be my child. I invite you into my family. You are my son. You are my daughter. There's no higher endorsement of value than that. Amen? I hear people counseling one another, and they say things like, God loves you. You're better than that. You're a child. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You don't have to be involved in that. And I want God to remind us every moment throughout this next year that how he values us in 2019. And I want that to lift you throughout the year. It's going to be a great year because you're valued by God. Thirdly, Jesus shows us how bright our future is. Jesus looked at the sick and the sinful from a different angle than we do. Jesus had a little different perspective on the, the prodigals and the outcasts. He shed a little different light on them because he didn't really focus on their past. He looked at the opportunities they had in their future. He didn't look at how much they had in their possessions. He looked at what they could grab hold of and what they could have in their future. Some people can look at a piece of land, barren land, and they see a garden. And there's a few of you who just could look at a piece of land, and there's one right there, and, and she could turn it into a beautiful garden. But before it's ever turned into that, it looks like an ugly swamp or an ugly piece of whatever, barren, but she sees it. Some of you can look at a rundown building or a vacant lot and you could say, I see a beautiful building on that. And you could build it. You could do it sitting right there. He's done it many times. He's done it on the mission field many times. He could see something, and it's not there. It's run down. It's decrepit. And God takes you, and he takes me, and he looks at you. <laughs> and he's honest. Oh, boy. <laughs> 
immaturity here is fallenness, there's brokenness, there's hurt, there's pain, there's rebellion, there's difficulties here. But he sees beyond that. He looks beyond that. He gets to the other side of that right away, and he sees forgiveness. He sees reconciliation. He sees the power of God. He sees the opportunities at hand that he sees you stepping into and being wonderful with a bright future. He doesn't just take our temperature and say, you're bad, and leave. He does it with a response and says, oh, no. This is where you are today, but tomorrow we're going to be here. We're going to move forward. We're going to grow every day. Sometimes it's hard to believe that as we look at this cruel world, that there could really be such forgiveness and such transformation in a person's life. We look around and we just like, oh, it's so heavy. It's so hard. It's so cruel out there. Can there really be such a good God with, with forgiveness and transformation? Can I really have a good year in 2019? Because the world's been beating me up and the world's been beating me down. And Jesus, is this, could this really happen to me? But Jesus, as we watch his life, opens our eyes and he makes us believe if we'll if we'll read these gospels, if we will really see his life. Sometimes we have enough faith to believe others. He could do that for others. Oh, he could forgive her and he could transform her life. But me, I'm a lost cause. Oh, he could grow other churches, but he can't grow our church. Oh, he could give other people a promotion in the job. He could really bless, but he's not going to do that for me. Oh, he could give other people a happy marriage, but my spouse is just forget it. We sometimes even have the faith to stretch to others, but take that faith and point it right down to you. He He has the power to make your future bright. He's Jesus. And let's believe that for 2019. Whatever it is for you, he enables the possibilities for us, for me also. Not just for everybody else, but for me. And they're great possibilities. Not not a new spouse, but just a better marriage. You understand? Don't take me wrong. Not not even a new job, but maybe a a better disposition toward the job. Not a new church, but but a vibrant church that you're stepping in deeper. Some even say, I I need a new God. And that's not true. We need to look at the life of Jesus and read these Gospels and, and let his life speak to us that he's got a bright future for us. He enables that. We see in the Gospels, he stripped out all the rituals, all the ceremonies, all the roadblocks people have, and he said, just come to me. And it's real simple. And then the possibilities start to unfold. Thomas Edison said, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. And there are going to be those opportunities knocking at your door this year that you're going to look at and you're going to be like, that's going to be hard. Honduras is hard. The next con church is hard. I mean, these, they're, they're going to be hard, but it doesn't mean it's not God. It doesn't mean you don't get your hammer and your work boots and your overalls on and you get out there and you start in with what God is calling us to do, an opportunity for you tell you about this little girl named Sophie, born in Siberia, desolate area of Russia. Russia. It was difficult for her as a child. Uh, she was an orphan. And at age two, she was adopted, sight unseen, by Lori Collis of Scottsdale, Arizona. And she was now in the third grade. She was doing well. She e- entered an essay contest out of 10,000 applicants. She won. It was done by the toy maker Lego and uh, the Planetary Society. And because she won, she got an all-expense trip paid to the Kennedy Center in Florida to watch the liftoff of the Mars rover. This was some years ago. And she got to read an excerpt, and this this is what part of it was. I used to live in an orphanage. It was dark and cold and lonely. At night, I looked up at the sparkly sky and felt better. I dreamed I could fly there. In America, I can make all my dreams come true. Thank you for giving me the spirit and the opportunity. So today's, uh, in this testimony, today on Mars is a little robot named Spirit and Opportunity. She won the contest, and so these two Martian vehicles, she got to name. And she named them 
after the two attitudes that brought her through her lonely time, lonely experience back in a Siberian orphanage. I want to tell you, when 2019 is going to be good, Jesus has a bright future for you. Step into it. It may take a hammer and overalls, but step into the opportunity that God opens for you in 2019. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, Jesus shows us how good we can be. Now, a lot of times we stay away from this because we're so afraid to talk about how good we need to be because, oh, no, we're not saved because we're good. Of course we're not. But we need to be good. And Jesus shows us just how good we be. Plato wrote and dreamed about the highest ethics, the evil and the good. He wrote it all in this book called The Republic. That was Plato. But Jesus never wrote anything. People wrote about him. Jesus just lived it. And he embodied the truth in his life, the goodness in his life. And we watch him. And he showed us, hey, we could love each other. Hey, I don't have to sin against someone and hurt them. I don't have to do that. I don't have to sin. That we could actually follow God and fulfill his plan for our lives because we watch Jesus do that and we say, I could do that. Jesus definitely lifted my personal ethics from when I pushed cocoa in the water. Je Ted's a deacon. Can you believe it? He was going to be hanged at age 21 by his teachers, remember? Jesus lifts our standard up so we can be good. And it's not beyond you. Half of the world claims Christ. And uses him, his standard, his ethical ex ethics as their own. Half the world standard her right and wrong. He's still a cloud by day and a pillar by night leading us onto the promised land. Some reject, some dislike Jesus. And we could certainly point to times that this world has failed. No question about that. But we're going to continue to follow Jesus if, if he doesn't come back for a thousand centuries. He, we're going to continue to follow him. It's permanent. This is part of mankind and a huge part of mankind. The real test of any ethic is whether we put it on, whether we do it. And Christianity has done things that it never should have done. But that wasn't Jesus. That was us missing the mark. But to me, we don't have to hang our head bow our head in shame because we're a Christian and we've done these, but no. I'm proud of being a Christian. I'm proud of what Jesus did. He transformed my personal character, me and Ted and the rest of you. He's holy and he taught me how to be, how to aspire toward his holiness. He didn't send us into it. He showed us how to be. And reading these gospels, I learned, wow, Jesus, that's how to be. And I love reading the gospel. He showed us inspires us how to live, how to love, what kind of character we need to, to have personally. Uh, and, and homes and families are together because he showed us that we're supposed to sacrifice ourselves for one another and stay in the marriage and stay in the parenting relationship. Hospitals and orphanage and schools are built because he showed us how to have goodwill toward man. It's hard, maybe, to follow Jesus, to fulfill his ethics in our life. We, listen, we look at the Sermon on the Mount and we're like, because we live in a corrupt world. But that's just the point. We don't want to attach our ethics to the corruption in the world. We want to attach our ethics to the, ethic, the standard of Jesus because he wants to lift us up out. He wants us to be better. He want, wants us to be the best we can be. He wants us to be good. This one little boy came running to his mom after he was reading, I guess, about Goliath. And he, and he said, Mom, you never believe I am nine feet tall. And, and, and his mother's like, well, really, uh, show me how you came up with that. So he gets his little shoe out, and he goes, one, two, three. And he said, nine feet tall. <laughs> Friends, in 2019, let God stretch your goodness. Walk around nine feet tall in your character, in your goodwill for others. Just be like Jesus. 
Fifthly and lastly, Jesus shows us how much better things can get. Jesus lived the most powerful life, the most powerful example was his vicarious sacrifice on the cross, giving himself completely for others. The, the gravity in the physical world, we all know about it. Anybody try to get up out of bed this morning, it's like, uh, that's gravity. This sacrifice of Jesus was more powerful in the spiritual world than even gravity in the physical. It permeates everything. The centerpiece here. Jesus on the cross expressed un, unbounded love. Just an all-in love. Nothing holding back love. I'm everything for you on the cross. He gave it all. And we see him in that picture in the Gospels. And we understand what he did for us. This Calvary love is more powerful than anything else in the world. The cross of Christ, the most impressive thing, I'm still not over it. It led a guy named Dr. Livingston into the darkest parts of Africa to bring the gospel there. It led a guy named Father Damien. The cross, the grasp of the cross, led a guy named Father Damien into a leper colony, and he stayed there until he got leprosy. He came there to help them. It led a gal named Florence Nightingale to the battlefields of Crimea. And so she was known as the lady with the lamp because at night she'd be out with her lamp on the battlefield taking care of the wounded soldiers. It was the cross that led her there. And I'll just talk about her life a little bit further. She's the founder of modern nursing. She established, established a nursing school. Today, nurses still have to take the Nightingale Pledge, as I understand it, in the U.S., which is a standard of ethics and a professional uh, level. It's called after her name. She improved the British literature. She helped the, the poverty in India. She abolished prostitution laws that were against the women. Why did she do that? It was because she read the Gospels and she saw this God going to a cross. She um, wrote extensively on religion. She was, as a young girl, influenced by the Wesleyan tradition. She was grown up that way. And uh, she felt genuine religion should come out in active care and love for others. There was a dying prostitute that Nightingale was tending to, and this prostitute said to her, she was concerned she was going to hell. She said, pray God that you may never be in the despair I am, I am in at this time. This prostitute's dying, thinking she's going to hell. The nurse replied, oh, my girl, are you not now more merciful than the God you think you're going to? In other words, you don't even understand his mercy. Yet the real God is far more merciful than any human creature ever was or can ever imagine. And that goes for you today, too. She had intense personal devotion to Christ. She believed religion helped people and gave them a good worth ethic. She wanted all her nurses to be attending services all the time, I mean, you know, regularly. It was the cross. It was the cross of Jesus that brought people to lay down their lives for the sake of lifting up other people. It was the cross that brought Livingston to Africa. It was the cross that brought Damien to the leper colony. It was the cross that, that brought this Florence Nightingale to the battlefields of Crimea. These were things, these were problems they never caused. These were battles that weren't their own battles. They did it in goodwill, just like Jesus came and gave goodwill to all man by the cross. In 2019, it's going to be better than ever for you because of the cross. Because we're, our, our future is bright and we're gonna, things are going to get better because we're going we're gonna to go deeper in the cross. Meeting Jesus uh, at the cross, the Jesus of the cross. It just 
It's awesome. And it empowers us to the highest level of living. In conclusion, and then I'm going to, in a moment, have you all come and I want to pray for you in this new year. Jesus gave us the picture of God in this frame. And when we see it, we realize this world isn't just random chaos. But there's real purpose, there's divine purpose. And we fall in love, not with an abstract idea of philosophy. Or so we fall in love with Jesus who embodies this, the way, the truth, and the life. We watch him show us the way, how to live as we read the Gospels. And when we, when we receive Jesus, we receive the way, the truth, and the life. We receive all of it. We have God's purpose running through our bodies just like our blood runs through our veins. When we look at Jesus, we can put our finger on the pulse. That is God. That is God's purpose. That is the truth. That is the way. That is the life. I could see it in Jesus. We see how Jesus loves and we see how he treats others. And we finally have an accurate picture of how we should be and how God is. So I'm going to have the worship team come and I want to pray for you five things in a moment. Let me tell you what they are. I want to pray over you for this year of 2019. That we would all understand how wonderful God is, first of all. We just have that revelation and throughout the year. Secondly, that we would understand how valuable we are. Thirdly, that we would know our future is bright. Fourthly, how good we can be. We could be good. And then how much better we can get. That's what I want to pray for you, pray over you as we head into 2019, this first service of the year. So would you just try to come and wrap around and let me pray for you uh, right now? Let's do that. We're going to close in a song in a moment, but first I want to pray for you. Just come and wrap all the way around if you could, so leave room.